I'm Emily Moshak, and you are listening to Tuned In to NOCO, Town Square Media's show that lets you know what matters in NOCO. I'm talking today with Dr. Whitney Cranshaw, an entomology professor at CSU, about the abundance of Miller moths that we have seen here in Fort Collins, as well as the presence of the emerald ash borer. So thank you for joining me today. Yes, uh, glad to be here. So I gathered from your research that the reason for the abundance of Miller moths this year is because of weather. Can you explain why that is? Well, well, there's two things in terms of how abundant uh, these moths are kind of in your face, in your yard, and uh, in your homes. And one of them has to do with how many there are. And some years we have more than others. But the other thing is weather, as you mentioned. And um, there's a couple of things that are related to weather, but but the big thing is to, to keep in mind is these moths are traveling through. Some of them have traveled 100, 200 miles before they get to Fort Collins. They're heading for the mountains. They're looking for nectar. And in many years, there's nectar all around. If it rains in spring, the, the prairies are in bloom. When you have a year like this, if it was dry, the prairies are, are pretty desolate. Furthermore, we had a freeze uh, in April 13th, whacked flowers all over. Uh, so where they uh, are concentrating is, is where there's bloom, which is our yards, irrigated yards. So there's a normal number, but they're more in our face this year because there's no other uh, flowers for them to find outside the, the places where people live. Okay. So it's really not so much that it's an abnormal number, but just that they're gathering in a more concentrated area. Yes, I, I call it oasis effect. Uh, when when you get these oases of, of flowering plants like we have this year, and and it contrasts strongly with last year. I mean, because last year was you know, they they had they could feed on flowers all over. They didn't have to be in your yard. But you know, historically, I would say the overall numbers are are pretty probably pretty normal. We didn't have big problems with the caterpillar stage before this. Sometimes we have huge numbers of the caterpillars, which produces huge numbers of the moths. Um, but I think what's getting people is the last four years were really low. Um, that We had few few moths and lots of flowers some, some years, and people didn't see much for the last four years, the four lowest years since I've lived here, since 1983. Uh, and then, so this year's kind of a surprise. We're back to more, more of a normal situation, at least by historic standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have definitely been surprised by the moths. I can say that for yeah. sure. You mentioned that by historic standards, this is pretty normal. What has been abnormal for the moths in the past? The, the last four years being so low. I mean, they were uh, three years before. They were all pretty low uh, numbers of moths and moderate numbers of flowers. Didn't have that late freeze. You know, they go up and they go down in terms of populations. And we had four four years when they were low. Um this year might be a little above average, but uh, again, over the last 30, 40 years, it's it's about normal number of moths overall. They're just more in our face because they don't have other places to go for them. They're concentrating in the urban area, in, in, in yards and gardens. Right. So what is your estimate for how long these moths are going to be around like they are now, so in our faces for this year? Well, the, the temperatures are good to keep pushing them up to the mountains. So these are uh, our, our insect people spend the summer up in the mountains. They're not laying any eggs until next fall. And they'll do that in uh, mostly wheat fields and alfalfa fields. So the temperatures are good. Nighttime temperatures are good to keep them pushing along. And when there's really nothing else for them to feed on down here, they'll all be gone. Uh, I usually think of the last big thing that they find for nectar is Russian olive. So when Russian olive is finished blooming, you know, they're, they're pretty much all, all up in the mountains for the summer. And that's probably about another week or so away, um, like looking at the, the couple plants here in town. So maybe a couple, three weeks, uh, it'll, it should be pretty much over by then. Okay. That's not too bad. I think, I think we can handle that. You have to. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> this, <laughs> like... is, this is part of Colorado wildlife. I mean, it's, uh, this is, this is a this is an interesting uh, phenomenon. I mean, I I worked with bugs for you know my whole life, and I I didn't even know about this until I moved out here. Uh, this is a kind of unusual migration where a moth 
makes a, a hundreds of miles migration in the spring up the mountains and then spends the entire summer just sipping nectar, getting fat, and then uh, comes to back down, uh, back down to the lowlands and lays eggs in, in the fall. And I don't know of another moth that does that in North America. I, the only the only moth I, I, I think that does something similar to that is, is a related kind you find in Australia. So, you know, people come from the East or California. I mean, they, they've never heard of anything like this. Huh. That's really interesting. I didn't realize it was so unique to Colorado. Well, it's it's Colorado and, and you know, adjacent areas. Of, uh, so Wyoming gets some and New Mexico gets some. But, but this High Plains, Rocky Mountain region is where we see it. And uh, it's, it's a lot bigger flight in eastern Colorado than in western Colorado because they're, again, coming from the eastern plains. Uh, some of them are coming from western Nebraska and Kansas. Uh, and uh, some of them are from the next county and some of them are from your yard. But the closer you are to the front uh, to the mountains, uh, the more are passing through your your uh, property. Right now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I was looking through your research, it was my understanding that we'll also be getting a reverse migration of these moths this year. There is so so again, no eggs are being laid. So one of the big concerns people have is you know while they're in my house, I'm going to worry. No, they're going to lay eggs. No, they're not going to lay eggs. These are not clothes moths. Uh, if they're in the house, they'll either get out on their own or die in your house. But it'd be end of the end of story. Um, so they they go on reproductive hold, and that's unusual. They, they're not laying eggs until late September or October, after they have returned um, back down to the, the eastern plains. Um, and and you might see some in September. The the flights going to the mountains are always way more. Uh, obvious than, than the return. They kind of dribble back, and, and a lot of them die up in the mountains, too. I gotcha. So I know that they won't lay eggs now in our houses, which is good to hear, but I know a lot of people are still looking to get rid of them, and I've heard yeah. about that soapy water trap. Is that the best way to go? Well, you could do that. Um, the uh, you know, you know, Moths will be attracted to lights because we, you know, we screw them up by having lights that Anyway, that's another story. But anyway, so, you know, moths are often attracted to lights. And uh, uh, if you had uh, some some water underneath it, a, soap, a pan of soap, I said just soapy water, just because it, uh, a little bit of soap uh, breaks the water tension. And uh, so it traps them better. Anyway, uh, light over some, some soapy water and then uh, uh, they'll bang into it and fall in. Um, one thing that kind of uh, can make them really go crazy uh, in your house is any kind of uh, ultrasonic noises, which you can do by just you know, jingling your keys or coins in your pocket. Try that. Shake your keys in your in your living room when you got a bunch of moss, and they will just zip all over the place and uh, bang into the light and fall into the water. You know, that actually makes sense now that I think about it, because whenever I do come home from work and I have my car keys, the ones in our house, they seem to immediately fly right toward me. So that kind of makes sense now. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, well, you can use that too. Uh, I, I didn't do it this time, but a couple of years ago, there was, you know, uh, they they like to hide in, in you know, things like spruce trees and the like during the day where it's cool. And and there was this couple walking down across the on the sidewalk across from me and walking past this big group of spruce trees. And I took my keys out and jingled them, and this they boiled out of there. So there was hundreds of these moths all over. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, stupid pet tricks you can do while we have them here. Yeah, I might as well. I mean, they're going to be here for a bit. Sure, making the birds happy. The uh, this is people ask what good are they, which is a terrible question to ask about anything. But the birds certainly are taking advantage of this, and and this is a time when birds are looking for food, uh, uh, looking for insects, and and it's very available. Uh, downside for some people is now they're no longer going to your bird feeder because they don't need to. There's moths everywhere, which are way more nutritional for them. I think the other th nice thing it helps the birds with is, is it's distracting all the cats and, and cats are chasing these Miller moths and they're running around the house and they're eating them and sometimes they're throwing up, but they'll live. But if you have, they're outdoor cats and outdoor cats kill tons of birds. But in a year like this, they're just chasing Miller moths. They're leaving the birds alone. So anyway, I think it's a double bonus to have Miller moths if you like birds. 
Yeah, I never thought about it that way. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about was the emerald ash borer because it was recently detected in Fort Collins. For those who are unfamiliar, what exactly does the emerald ash borer do to ash trees? Well, it's a it's a non-native insect that got here, and it it uh, has extraordinary ability to kill trees. Uh, just ash. It's not native to North America, and North American ash trees have no resistance to it. So, um, what has been the the pattern in in areas where it has gotten in in the past uh, that it becomes a progressive kind of injury, and maybe you know four, five, six years, maybe more. Uh, uh, after after it starts working a tree, uh, the tree's dead. Um, and, and we have lost hundreds of millions of ash trees since this insect was first detected in Michigan in 2002. Uh, it's, it's the worst forest insect to have ever landed on the shores of North America. It's, it's, it's you know, a game-changing species. It's destroying you know, a whole genus of, of plants. And you know, ash trees aren't native here, but we sure rely a lot of, uh, on them heavily for, as a street tree. Uh, it's about 20 percent of our street trees are ash trees, green ash, white ash, things like autumn purple and the like. So it's a big deal. Several years, within several years after they come onto your property and start working on your ash tree, it it can progress to to death. It uh, usually will, unless you decide to treat it with insecticide. Now the the Fort Collins situation is uh, is is just in a tiny spot. I mean, the whole town is not infested right now. I don't think. I mean, it's it's only been detected. Actually, uh, even I don't even think it's in town uh, city boundaries. It's extreme north end, uh, and just in the immediate area where they found it, it was found by a very sharp eyed uh, uh, arborist who was doing some pruning and, and noticed that there was a a tunnel of the type in the branch, and uh, so caught it quick. Uh, so you know, like people in maybe uh, north end of town. Uh, uh, maybe should be a, a little more worried than certainly the ones in the south end of town. Uh, anyway, mm-hmm. but but when it gets here, you you have you have to make a decision. Uh, am I going to treat my tree with insecticides for as long as I want to keep it, or am I going to let it go and chop it down? And uh, it, it becomes a, a much higher maintenance tree. But the insect can be treated. Uh, there there are effective treatments. Is there a better option when you recognize that you have an infected tree between treatment and cutting it down, or is it just situational? That's it. It will ultimately kill the tree, and there's no magic bullet other than uh, uh, several different kinds of insecticide treatments that that have been identified that, that can control it. And it can control it even several years after you know, it started in your tree. I mean, it's a progressive condition, and it's irreversible to some degree. So, you know, you could have it in your tree two, three years and, and then treat it then and, and you can bring it back around. But those are your options. You, 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 know, you, you treat forever uh, as long as you want the tree once it's in your neighborhood or, or you, you kiss it goodbye. It's sad. Look, I, I don't know if anybody here you know, is from uh, the Midwest, Michigan, Ohio, uh, you know, places like, I mean, just go in those parts of the country where it's been for 15, 20 years and drive around and the trees that are dead are ash trees. They're all dead, except for the ones that people have chosen to save. How can someone recognize if they have the ash borer on their property? What are the signs on trees? Well, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult. Um, there, there are things that are absolutely you know, positive. Uh, you'd have to see this tunnel or, or it, it makes, when the adult comes out, it makes a, a exit hole. It's a D-shaped exit hole. Um, Different kinds of bores make different sized holes. Or uh, and this is a D-shaped exit hole, uh, and uh, uh, there's some tunneling. But but that's that's the best way. Unfortunately for us, um, it's hard to tell if you have it because Colorado ash trees look like hell. They look terrible. <laughs> People and particularly this year, the trees all along the front range got hammered, hammered, hammered by that uh, April 13th freeze. And they came out late. They, they lost their first flush of buds. They're coming, I mean, trees, lots of trees died from that. And, you know, people from the Midwest uh, 
you know, it, you know when out there where it's easier to be a tree, you know, you see a progressive decline of the tree over time. Uh, so it gets thinner, the leaves get thinner and uh, smaller and thinner at the top, and it progresses, and and that's from the cumulative effects of the insect. And they come out to Colorado and they go, oh my gosh, it's emerald ash borers everywhere. And we have to tell them, no, that's what Colorado ash trees look like. It's, <laughs> it's really tough to be a tree here. They lo- always look like, they always look terrible. So it's way easier to, to find symptoms that are truly emerald ash borer in the Midwest. And here we have so many confounding things that screw up our ash trees. Yeah, it does always amaze me whenever I travel to the Midwest. I have grandparents in Wisconsin, and it's just, yeah, it's so shocking to look at how green it is and how many trees they have. I'm not used to it. Yeah, I know. I'm originally from New England. I go back, and and I find it oppressively green (laughs) after having lived here for most of my life. Yeah. So you talked about how the emerald ash borer spreads so fast. Now that it's in Fort Collins— Will we ever be able to get rid of it, or is it just a part of the Fort Collins ecosystem now? No, we're we're that's it. Uh, uh, they, there have been efforts in the past to try to uh, eradicate it, and none of them have been successful. One of the big one of the big problems is is, is you you really can't reliably know where it is um, uh, because there's no good trap. Um, for some insects, there's a good trap, and, and we could probably say if we put these traps out, we know the insect is in the neighborhood. Well, there's never, there isn't one, despite a lot of work. So it's always further away than where you, you, you know it is. So um, no, it can't be. No, it's uh, we're SOL here. Some some jerk brought it into Fort Collins, and you know um, it's our problem now. Somebody brought it into into Boulder in about 2008, 2009, and infested Colorado. I don't know who, who brought it into, into Fort Collins, but it, it didn't get here on its own. Some some jerk, some criminal jerk brought it here. <laughs> it was illegal to carry ash wood into, uh, from an infested county anywhere in the country uh, mm. across county lines to Colorado, but somebody did it, and now Fort Collins has to deal with it earlier than it would have otherwise. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cranshaw. It was great talking to you today. I learned so much. Is there anything else you would like listeners to know? No, just uh, a lot of the uh, information on particularly the Emerald Ash Board. Uh, do, do check the county extension office. They're really good on this. Uh, we also have fantastic city forestry in this town. They're, they're right on top of it. So uh, unlike some places in, in the state, I, I think uh, we've got really top people with uh, CSU Extension for Larimer County and also uh, City Forestry here in Fort Collins. That is good to know. Well, thank you again, Dr. Cranshaw. I really appreciate it. Again, that was Dr. Whitney Cranshaw, an entomology professor with Colorado State University. To learn more about the emerald ash borer and other entomology research at CSU, visit agbio.agsci.colostate.edu slash outreach hyphen button slash insect hyphen information.